So uh, speaking, speak, we have our uh, speaker, Sumi. So, uh, I'll be handing the session over to her. She's the founder of uh, Generative AI Labs, and she's dedicated to helping business leverage the power of generative AI to drive innovation and growth through strategic collaboration. Uh, before uh, launching Gale, she worked she worked as a machine learning engineer at People Scout. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today, Sumi. I'll be handing over the session to you now. Thank you, Kagana. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. It's uh, good to have you guys here. I am going to talk a little bit about um, AI-driven talent acquisition which is very uh, timely, I must say, because we are in this amazing time where AI can do so much, but we haven't tapped it to the right potential. And my conversation is going to be mostly interesting, I must say, um, and we'll go from here. So let me share my screen. Alrighty, so uh, how do we get to better filter? In fact, not filtering out people, but filtering in people. Now, before I get started, what, what does talent acquisition mean? I'm pretty sure all of you have heard the terms hiring or recruitment, but talent acquisition is a level up when it comes to hiring and recruitment. Um, and hiring is, or recruitment is more like a short-term reactive way of filling up a position. Talent acquisition is a long-term strategic way of filling position or developing a person to fit into a role higher than where they were hired. So it's a very interesting, um, interesting way of actually getting people into a job. Um, now, this is something that I did before I started Gale, which is Generative AI Labs. And my role right now at Gale is more to leverage Generative AI in different, different uh, levels for, for a variety of business use case. We'll not get there this time. We'll talk about that another time. Um, alrighty, so getting started. As I said, we are in a very interesting time. These days, there is a lot of conversation about how robots are gonna take away our jobs. And we all have heard about how ChatGPT will kill all the jobs, how generative AI is set to affect some number of 300 million or something jobs across ma major economies. The Future of Job Report 2020, AI is expected to replace 85 million jobs and so on. A bigger problem than automation. So in simple terms, we are kind of stuck between a robot and a rock. Well, how did we get here? That's, that's a question that we will explore, but isn't that interesting <clears throat> that there is all this chatter about robot-driven job apocalypse when there is a very tight labor market. And I, I want to say, I want to say globally, there is a very tight labor market where there are a lot more jobs open, where the, but there are fewer people to fill it in. And the question here is, are there fewer people or are there, or is there a mismatch between the job open and the people, what they want to do? Are we, kind of talking about recruitment on Tinder, where you swipe right, swipe left, have a checklist, and then hire people based on checklists. I think that's exactly what today's recruitment is about. It's like, you know, the world's worst matchmaker. There are over hundreds of technologies that is employed in recruiting and uh, and this this uh, infographic is from 2018 trust me there are far more, more but it just it was a more captivating inf infographic for today so despite the fact that there are so many 
technologies available to, to help in every, every level of recruitment. Recruitment is still challenging. Recruitment is still not very um, holistic in nature. So what's the monster in the room? The monster in the room is the standard model. And we'll talk a little bit about standard model. Standard model is nothing but an optimization technology that actually either increases or decreases or optimizes certain cost function. And in case, in, when we talk about recruitment or hiring, the measure of success is typically defined by time to hire or cost per hire. There are two measures that we typically use to actually define the success. And if you think about it, none of them, neither of them. I mean, there are other human measures, but there are two main measures. Neither of these two are actually human, right? Time to hire is a process, cost per hire is a process different. So the concept of standard model was given by Stuart Russell. And for those of you who are in data science and machine learning or AI, you need to know who Stuart Russell is. Stuart L Russell is a stalwart in artificial intelligence. I call him the godfather of art artificial intelligence. He, he actually, I would say, uh, democratized the field by writing the best books or doing best research in it. So not talking about Stuart Russell, we can go on and on about him. What is standard model? Standard model is an AI agent that has worked on optimizing objectives proposed by humans. And in our case, it's like reducing time to hire or cost per hire. But the problem is that we never considered the most critical question. Are these metrics human compatible or are these metrics provably beneficial to humans? And my talk will be more around this concept, but we'll get a little bit more technical. So it's like a good mix of philosophical questions like, are we, are we using AI in the right way or not? So moving away from checklists to a provably benefit, beneficial AI for humans, especially in the case of recruitment or talent acquisition, I propose a holy trinity of talent acquisition that lies in building equity, which is employment equity. We'll talk more about it. The second pillar is providing comparable or better alternate path. The third pillar is enabling decision transparency. And from where I come, if we incorporate all the, these three pillars in technology, it will drive away from a reactive checklist-based recruitment to a long-term strategic talent acquisition. Okay, so the first pillar, building employment equity. What do you really mean by building employment, uh, ah, employment equity? It, really, it actually means giving everyone an equal chance to apply and to be considered for the dream job. I like to use the word dream job because it kind of resonates with where humans really want to be. And where does, uh, where does employment equity come from? It comes from algorithmic de-bias or where does it, not come from it's it doesn't come from algorithmic bias you know how however you want to place it so algorithmic bias in job recommender system reduces employment equity so it's interesting that the first paper that i found came out in 2022 december about algorithmic bias in job job recommendation system and this was an audit approach and what did they find? Of course, nothing new, that algorithms are, uh, are being used. Um, uh, the use of algorithm is widespread in recruiting, but
but almost gets no attention among labor studies. Very limiting. Second, 12.3% of recommended jobs are seen only by identical male or female resumes. Only male recommend recommendations offer modestly high salaries. Recommended jobs strongly reinforce common gender stereotypes. So going back to our first, uh, our first pillar, equity, all these things are hampering the employment chances or equity. Now within equity, I like to divide it into further three pillars or three fourths. And the first one is equity by positioning, which is basically saying that how does a job description really um, you know, define who is going to apply for this position? And re research has found that job descriptions that rely on stereotypical male words tend to result in fewer female applicants. So all the girlfriends out there, when you see male words like, hey, decision-making, independent leadership, charge, supervision, um, self-motivated and innovative entrepreneur, please apply. <laughs> so there has been enough research done to actually demonstrate linguistically how and psychologically how the choice of words really play their role in who applies for the position. And the researchers that we are talking about before actually divided uh, the different board groups into these uh, six uh, clusters. And what really drives me insane is like, hey, you go to personality cluster, the, the lowest one down there, women apply where the, they hear word or see words like careful, patient, outgoing, whereas men, men or masculine words are more self-motivated or innovative and things like that. So, um, so first, positional, uh, positional equity by just discriminating based on the choice of words. The second, under the equity pillar, lies the equity by reach, which is targeted advertisement or, or algorithmic advertisement matching and ranking. Now, interestingly enough, if you do not inform people of a job opportunity, that is a very effective barrier. So I don't know, this job exists. I'm never going to apply for it. And in, luckily enough, um, algorithms really make it easy for us to do. But remember, these algorithms have been optimized using the standard optimization techniques to minimize the cost in terms of the dollar amount to fill the role and the time to fill the role. They do not necessarily use any kind of uh, cues to, 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 um, to actually involve, like, you know, the human impact or to maximize the human impact in some way. So targeted job placement, this is, this is something that was off LinkedIn. This is how they supposedly uh, help recruiters decide where do they want to target their jobs. And that has member age, member gender, member group, years of experience, all fallacies, all fallacies on steroid. Now, this is a little bit older um, info. It's not as easy to understand what LinkedIn is doing now. That's, that's been a challenge. So hyper-targeted job placement actually creates a closed system. It almost cre creates a filter bubble. The term says it all. So filter bubble, another great book written by Eli Perry, sir, sorry for uh, butchering the name, but a great book about how Filtering creates this ginormous bubble of, you know, filtering, like collaborative filtering and things like that. Create a ginormous bubble of self-contained closed systems. So even before you and I apply for jobs, predictive technologies start playing a very decisive role in determining who even learns about the open positions. And all that goes back 
to how those jobs have been preconceived to be, you know, well fitted into a certain persona. So there is definitely a social aspect to it, but there, the, the algorithmic aspect actually aggravates it further. So going back to hyper-targeted matching and ranking, the candidate generation is the first step. All of us or most of us have heard about recommender system in which candidate is generated in some combination of con content-based filtering and collaborative filtering. In job recommendation, the content-based filtering actually captures the behavior of the job seeker on the website. Like what jobs did you previously apply and what are your on-site activities? So what kind of jobs are you clicking? What kind of people are you connecting to? So if you decide to apply for a job which is entry level, you would probably only get recommended for entry level jobs. That's, that's changing, I do agree, but that's internally the, the nuance. Collaborative filtering actually captures the behavior of similar candidates. Now, similar in codes, similarity is, uh, I wish as simple as cosine similarity, but probably it is not. And even if it is, the feature vector is going to be far more complicated. So similar candidates may deem some job seekers compatible or incompatible for a certain position. So the result of these filtering is reinforcement of cognitive biases and existing stereotypes. Same old, same old filter bubble. Then comes the ranking. Now, ranking is two types of ranking. One type is a job ranking when you are as a candidate looking for job and the other type of ranking is ranking in front of recruiters of people who are looking at new candidates to actually hire. Now in both types of job rank, uh, both types of ranking, there is a similarity score again and the ranking is based on similar applications clicked by recruiters and other jobs. So for example, a recruiter doesn't like me being doesn't like my name, doesn't click me, probably the next time a recruiter is supposed to be seeing me as an applicant or, a, or, a, or considering me as a candidate would not see me at the top of the list, even though I fill, fulfill all the requirements. So it's a little bit complicated, of course, but it results in underrepresentation, massive underrepresentation. Again, reinforcing the biases. So this was the first pillar of equity part two. Now we come to first pillar equity part three, equity by valuation, which, and this is my, my grouping. So equity by valuation, I like to call it, value is driven by your screening, assessment, interview, and selection process. And um, employment tests have a very deep trouble history and, uh, and, uh, and they have been seen to be inherently discriminatory against people of color and people with different abilities. In some cases, they are obviously, I mean, this kind of extrapolate to women and um, underrepresented groups in a specific uh, uh, you know, job type. So, hey, that's great, right? I think the recruiter likes me and probably will go forward with the process. Then comes a bunch of other steps like engaging the candidate. That means the candidate is being told that, hey, you know what, you, let's move on to the next step. You have a pre-screening stuff coming up. And pre-screening could be some simple behavioral questions. In our case, women who code have to go through hackerang or leak code kind of a pre-screening. Um, then there could be an assessment. Again, that assessment could be a, a very stringent, like again, a hackathon kind of a thing, based assessment, standardized, non-standardized interviews. Sometimes interviews are video interviews or virtual interviews. Um, 
sometimes it is actually video interview that has a facial, like, you know, express behavioral attribute expression going on, sorry, capturing going on. So what goes on here? Pre-screening. The whole idea of pre-screening basically is debunked because it's like, you know, preemptively discouraging a candidate to be a poor fit. So you've been told, hey, you know what? Just because you didn't do good on this one, you're not a fit. Assessment, typically standardized, but standardized for who? A question that should be asked from a technology perspective. Again, fine-tuned, all these things are fine-tuned on employer data. Doesn't it reinforce past patterns? Probably yes. Questions like, hey, how many languages do you know? Second languages, what about the missing richness of multilingual candidates that it, it's never being captured? Um, then video interviews, very common, right? Uh, probably in some, in some level, very common. They use physical features and facial expressions that have no causal link with workplace success to inform hiring decisions. All these are technology-driven attributes or, or results, again, without actually considering provably beneficial to humans. So next two slides, we'll talk about solution to equity problem. I divide the solution into positional debiasing, bursting the filter bubble, and representative architecture. So positional debiasing um, basically is, in my case, synonymous to neutral job description. And this is, you know, the idea around positional debiasing came to me by reading this paper, which is perfectly titled, man is to computer programmer as women is to homemaker. So how do we debias? How about we start where we, where we all like, you know, especially in, in NLP, where we start right now with deep learning, embeddings, Let, let's start debiasing the embedding. And debias, they discuss two rules for debiasing embeddings. First is reducing bias by ensuring that gender, gender neutral words such as nurse are equidistant between gender pairs, such as he and she. So nurses are usually clubbed with she. That's not very accurate. The second step that they suggest is to maintain embedding utility. For example, correcting, correctly maintaining definitional gender associations, such as the one between man and father. So two-step process by reducing bias and maintaining embedding equity, they, they say that if we can de-bias the word embedding, we actually clean up at the source. So what if we can't really get all the cleanup done at the source? Then there are technologies like, you know, text, Textio that give us a second option. The other option is to present the user with the temperature a mapping of the tonality of the, uh, the um, text in front of us. So that helps in giving, you know, better tonality, less masculine, more masculine, or what are the strengths and problems, things like that. So yes, there are solutions out there, devising or suggesting better tonality. The second, second, uh, uh, you know, solution is bursting the bubble. So how do we burst the bubble is by preventing mirroring social patterns. And I think there are three different ways of doing it. First is using data-driven method by data di diversification, deliberate oversampling. The second method within bursting the bubble or removing the social patterns are feature-driven. And one of the feature-driven methods that we just discussed was debiasing the embedding. The other feature-driven methods that we could actually, you know, carefully um, work on is removing the input trait problems. That means removing features that have no causal relationships with performance. So when you do uh, feature generation, you have to step back and think about it. 
is facial expression really important for the person to be successful in this job? Probably not. Things like that. Then there is obviously an algorithm driven. And one of, and I'm sorry, I forgot to put the link here. Uh, there is this great paper, I think it came out just last year on adversarial network representation learning to remove the filtering bubble effect from recommendation system, which can be, I, in my, from, from in, in my you know, point of view, used for job recommendation. So we're getting there. Um, we can burst the bubble by these three methods, being more cognizant. And then finally, building representative talent ranking architecture. That's the final pillar, which is basically, this is something that LinkedIn does. And they came up with this architecture two years back where they created a multi-level architecture where they do a representative re-ranking where they make sure that they have uh, equal demographic representation on the top K candidates uh, you know, presented to the recruiter. A very, uh, very timely, timely method to move forward with. Okay, so again, till now we were talking about equity. Now let's go on to something that is super close to my heart, providing a comparable or better alternate career path. Some points in our lives, we have done so much and we are like, okay, you know what? I know how to code. I'm a great de a developer. I don't know if I want to continue to be an IC or maybe I wanna go and become a manager. I don't know who would be able to help me guide through. Then you start looking for a mentor and hey, you guys need a mentor. Um, I, can, I can sign myself up for that. Please connect on LinkedIn and, and let me know if I can help you with anything. But going back to some serious stuff here. So um, if algorithmically we could, we, we could naturally provide people with alternate career paths and, and help them bridge the skill gap, that would be so much useful. And especially say you are applying for jobs and you're applying for 10 different jobs. And if you could be suggested that, hey, you know what? You're applying for a data science job. How about you also apply for a machine learning engineer job? Or how about you could be a good statistician because you also have a statistical background or something like that, computational biology, quite similar, but it's, it's there but we still miss on the nuances. Again, I, I love reading. So uh, Decoding Talent, it's a very new book. It talks about the, the three, uh, three different like, you know, uh, fallacies, like the uh, year of experience fallacy, resume fallacy, and there's one more, sorry, my bad. Um, and then Hire Smart, another great book on algorithmic hiring. And the gist of both of these books are on mapping the DNA of person job fit. And they both discuss on going past experiences. That means not just looking at a two-dimensional resume, mapping the DNA of per person job fit, which is generalization of skills and testing for potential over experience. Now, great stuff, but how do we really do this algorithmically? And knowledge graphs and concept extraction and ontologies are answer. So mapping the skill set into an ontological hierarchy and where you can cluster them into defining skills, distinguishing skills and necessary skills is the way to go. So instead of say LinkedIn asking us to list our 50 skills, humans are beyond 50 skills. We have way many skills than you can actually list on LinkedIn. How about LinkedIn can automatically connect you to all the other skills that are relevant with respect to the top 50 skills that you have listed out. Indeed it does something like that, but not entirely. It, it lets, uh, 
lets the candidate decide if they're doing the right thing or not. But what if it's automatically done? And then we go back to the question where we ask, what is my alternate path? And we can give you something very useful like, hey, do you like to be independent? Are you a team-based player? Do you have a strong people skill? Are you less people focused? You have all these options that you can dabble with being a software developer. And that's where we can start generating those meaningful connection between skill and a true job. So alternate path is a second big pillar of the trinity of equity, alternate path, and the third is transparency. We'll jump to that right away. So enabling, enabling decision transparency, this is a no-go. This is like obviously obvious. Okay, so LinkedIn Easy Apply. Hmm. Automated term matching to filter candidates. Great. Candidates may not even know how the term matching works, and their application may be rejected without even a clear explanation. And remember, you could only do 50 skills in LinkedIn, and then you realize, oh, communication. I did presentation, but I didn't do communication, so I do not match that. I only match like six out of maybe 10 skills required. And presentation is classically related to communication. So it definitely has that gap. And there is a complete lack of transparency how these matchings really work. The second thing is, how did you test me on? Where, where is the rubric? I think all of us went to college and we knew exactly what we are going to be tested on. How are we going to be graded on? And the best practice to include in a rejection email, and this is indeed best practice, is to give a feedback. And unfortunately, we never get feedback. The, there is a complete lack of transparency. And the reason for lack of transparency is not just human, but it's also process. And the process actually is so, so opaque from one level to another that it's probably not easy to give you the feedback. I feel the simplest possible solution is just twofold. Whenever you use AI, make it explainable, make it mandatory to be explainable. And second, if you can actually create a simple data process visualization to provide candidate with a clear overview of the hiring process and the factors that are being considered in decision-making. Just simple, plain, vanilla transparency would complete this entire circle or close the loop for moving from you know, checklist-based hiring to an actual talent acquisition. And again, reiterating equity was a first pillar second pillar was alternate path, and the third pillar is transparency. So recruiting process is critical gateway to economic opportunity. Going back to my cheesy, crazy start about, you know, recruiting being like LinkedIn, it's time for us to, oh, not LinkedIn, sorry, Tinder, time for us to move from a blind date to true love. That's it. Okay, that's, I mean, I know it was an abrupt ending, but, but this is where it is. I am open to questions. Hi everyone, um, this is a dedicated time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, you can drop them in the Q&A box. And uh, great presentations to me and 
uh, it's it's just refreshing to see how artificial intelligence could you know transcend into a space like hr which is quite subjective and people oriented but there is still opportunity for artificial intelligence to be integrated here and make better decisions so thank you for such great insights uh, i like i personally had a question so uh, from your experience has there been any pushback because people are very uh, comfortable with the traditional way of working or this is something which is is it like uh, expensive to uh, implement in terms of infrastructure or people who are actually aware of how ai and hr integrates so is there any pushback on those terms so there is definitely a pushback from um you know technology always brings challenges and it challenges norms right and we are talking about uh, equity we're talking about diversity and um there is definitely an uncomfortable conversation and an elephant in the room where we don't want to discuss all that but um, but I feel we are inching towards that. I think there is a lot of conversation, like you know, in different circles. And uh, fortunately, uh, HR is it's it's one of those fields where it's like you know it's full of technology. It's just that we don't know how to do it right yet because we don't know what is right. And to define that right, it is important for us to, to as you said, you know, move from subjectivity to objectivity, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's it's getting there to answer your question. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think it's not either or, I think both ways can work together, like the traditional yes. ways and new ways, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, Audiences, if you have any questions, please let us know. Sumi is here to answer. So I do want to talk about, um, you know, how how I feel it would change in next year, few years, maybe a half a decade or something, is where people have a natural path from where they started to the next level based on a complete like a profile of who they are from you know at workplace or outside and uh, how how they are comfortable navigating their work life so i i feel that will be a, the natural next step when it comes to that perfect job uh, you know process or hiring process We have a question. Uh, can applicants also benefit from this in terms of making better decisions while applying if they're made more aware of the AI driven processes and they're more transparent? Absolutely. It's a very good question. Yes. Uh, applicants should be made aware of the whole process because then they would know what to expect and they can either be mentally prepared or even intellectually prepared for that process uh, at this point the whole process is so opaque and it's so like you know there is uh, no natural flow from one interview to another interview and they are all so segregated that it doesn't really truly capture a person's capabilities to succeed in that position very true because this is like i think a two-way street not just a recruiter but also a recruiting um, mm -hmm. based process yeah i think it will need in like it will need acceptance from both sides for it to work well yeah. any other questions I think it was such a nice presentation. You didn't leave any room for questions or doubts because uh, like I was also not expecting that there could be like so much good amount of like technicalities or math behind this, but, but this is like refreshing to see. 
and i hope everyone else also enjoyed and learned absolutely i i i hope that i hope the same that everybody enjoyed and yeah if you have any more questions or anything that i can help you guys with please reach out uh, um i am on linkedin mostly trying to branch out on twitter but hasn't haven't gotten any time for that yet but yeah it was thank you for this opportunity um everybody thank you everyone for joining and if uh, no one has a question maybe we can wrap it up sumi is there anything you would like to add no oh, thank you that's about it thanks again all right everyone thank you again for joining and thank you sumi thank you gagana for being a wonderful host and moderator um we'll see you again sometime soon sumi thank sure. you again yeah Absolutely. bye everyone bye